Oh, thank you. Um, so, uh, good afternoon. My name is Jeb Livingood. I'm the Associate Director of the Creative Writing Program here at the University of Virginia. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to a conversation with John Casey and do a few remarks about the festival here just to set things up. Um, welcome to the Virginia Festival of the Book. If you could just take a moment and silence your cell phones, although they do encourage me to have you fire them up immediately after you leave and do hashtag VA Book 2015 and talk about the event and about the festival, but not until you leave. Um, and uh, I see some verbiage in here that I'm pretty sure is Kevin McFadden's doing. It says, the festival is free of charge, but not free of cost. Please remember to go online and give back or uh, pick up a giving envelope from the information desk at the Omni and support your festival so that we can sustain it for many more years. We're blessed to have this wonderful festival here in Charlottesville, and if you can help support it, please do. Um, there are evaluations, yellow forms that you received on the way in. The front side that pertains to this reading is what uh, you should fill out for the reading. The back side you can fill out uh, either right now or you can do that online, but the front side is what pertains to the reading and what they'd like you to turn in. Um, book sales, we're blessed to have the UVA bookstore um, here selling books in the back after the reading, and I think John's more than happy to do signing as well. Um, so, we'll go on to the program and the participants. Um, I'm not going to talk about myself, I'll talk about John. Um, John Casey is the author of six works of fiction, including Spartina, winner of the National Book Award, and most recently, Compass Rose, as well as nonfiction and translations. And my, my, one of my favorites is the Urine Animal Viscovitz by uh, Alessandro Bofa. It's just a hilarious read. Um, educated at Harvard College, Harvard Law School, and the Iowa Writers Workshop. He lives in Charlottesville, Virginia, where he teaches at the University of Virginia and is our Henry Hoynes Professor of English. Um, I've known John since I was a student in the MFA program, and he and I share a few sporting loves. Um, I don't row, which is John's true passion, but we do both run and we both have done some sailing and canoeing. We've also both done judo. Um, and I talk about judo way too much. My, the MFAs that are in the audience will attest to this. Um, but I always find that the effort it takes to do judo well is a pretty good metaphor for what it takes to do writing well. And there's also something about tangling with a, a master in judo, a sensei, that is similar uh, with dealing with uh, somebody like John in writing. Um, judo, unlike some other martial arts, is truly a combative sport. You actually approach each other and grab a hold of each other and try and throw each other down to the ground. Um, writing's not exactly like that, but, uh, but hey, bear with me for just a moment. Um, but if you play someone inexperienced, somebody who's afraid of falling, who's unsure of their technique, that combative aspect of judo is amplified. Um, the, the amazing thing is, though, when you play someone experienced, it's as though they disappear on you. You go to grab them, and it, you feel as though you're simply holding on to an empty coat. Every time you move, they move with you. You take a step forward, and they dodge to the right. It's as, it's as though they're not really there, because what they're doing is allowing you to make your motion, and then they turn it. Um, and John teaches writing a little bit this way. I don't mean that he puts me on the ground for a foot sweep in workshop, but what I mean is that he takes the impulse of what the writer is doing and turns it and works with it as opposed to active resistance. Um, I, I think. Uh, I, th I find him to be remarkably open in both in accepting techniques. People will sometimes dis dismiss certain techniques or a first-person point of view, and John sort of says, well, wait a minute, there's actually several different ways you can approach a first-person point of view, so let's talk about that, and you can see that in his book here. And I think that's the mark of a good writer and also a good judo player, too. Um, they don't hunch down and get defensive. They actually open up and receive what you're trying to do. Um, the, one of the places I saw this the most was in workshop, and because I, I, I stole one of John's teaching techniques from workshop. Workshop is the foundation of MFA programs across the country. It's where you bring in your fiction manuscript. Uh, it goes out to the class, and then a week later, everyone comes back and comments on it. And it can be a it can be a wonderful experience. It can also be a brutal experience as a, as a young writer. Um, but John's advice was that you had to read the manuscript two times. Um, and the first time, he said, I want you to pretend, if I, I may not have the details exactly right, but this is close. I want you to pretend that after years of waiting tables, you've gotten a job at a literary magazine on the other side of the country, and you're flying out in the plane, and you get into your plane seat, and you settle down, and you suddenly realize that you've forgotten all of your reading material. And so you rummage through and look at the 
the vomit sack and then the, the plane egress information. But then there's an envelope in the back of the seat back that has a story in it. And you're so happy to have something to read on this long plane trip. And that's the joy you should bring to your first reading of a manuscript for a workshop, is that you come to it as though you're just so happy to have something to read. Um, he said, then the second reading, when you're getting ready for workshop, I want you to come in as though you've landed at LAX and you've gotten your new job at the literary magazine where you're going to become the young editor. And you get a call from your benefactor, who's paying for the magazine, and says, well, I hope you enjoyed my nephew's story, which I left for you in the back of the airplane, um, because it's going in the next issue. You can publish anything else you want, but that one's going in. So how are you going to make it? How are you going to improve it? How are you going to work with it? Am I more or less on the mark here? That's very, yeah. That's All right. Very okay. I, I had a Greyhound bus. But well, okay. <laughs> I, I upgraded us to airfare. I'm sorry. Um, but it gets back to what I was talking about, about trying to work with the story as opposed to against it. So I, I, I guess we'll start the conversation. John, the, the age-old question, can you, can you teach writing? Is this is mine on? Oh, all right. Is is it, can you hear me from here? Okay. Uh, no. But um, you can the the three things that we that that an MFA program does. The first one, which we've gotten pretty good at after a while, um, is you pick. Well, it, 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 there's, you have an instinct which is like that of a pig finding a truffle. And you nose around in the dirt, and you can find a tr truffle. And, and, and once you get the, tr the truffles, uh, then you bring them here, give them s some money. Not enough. Uh, because one of, the, one of the things that I love about Charlottesville is that when I go, go to eat out, uh, uh, I'll run into former students who are waiting on the <laughs> table. But almost all of the people that we've taken in in the last 20 years have successfully published. And, um, and then, but there are, there, are, there, are, there are lots of things to, to, to learn. Some of, them are, some of them are craft things. Uh, so sometimes you can, you can ad advise someone to, to how can I put this to uh, 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 take take a completely different tack? Uh, I, I've done that a couple of times, very shyly, but it, 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 in both cases it, it worked out. And if if anyone wants to know, I'll give you I'll give you the the details of the example. Um, and then the, the one thing that we don't do here very much, and I don't think we should. Peter Taylor, who was here, uh, oh eons and eons ago, and he was the person who brought me here. He, 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 got, he, wanted, he wanted a junior assistant, and I was thrilled to, to, to do that. Um, he, he, he's someone I'd known a long time and who made a little huge difference in my life. And then, um, um, so, the, 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 but the main thing is you can teach, you can, not so much teach, but you can urge and give examples of rewriting because a lot of people, I mean, for yeah, I, I'm sympathetic to that. I thought if I'd written in a trance, it came from heaven. <laughs> Who would dare change it? <laughs> and I used to write in fountain pen. And my handwriting at that time was large and, and very ha handsome. And I, it seemed a, a shame to cross out that beautiful work of art. <laughs> and, and so, but, so then I changed to, to ballpoint. Uh, uh, and which is, and my handwriting got worse and worse and worse. Uh, uh, so it's, and you can, yeah, you can certainly, you can certainly uh, urge people. And I, it, I don't think you can. It's it, the the worst kind of director for a stage play is someone who would say to the to the actor, read it like this. Oh no, <laughs> you can't, you can't, you can't. You, there, there's no way you can do that it just it just stiffens the whole process but you can you can s sit there uh, interesting and then i'm uh, yes i well we're there um, 
the best, I got uh, two letters when I was in my 20s about stuff that I'd written. Uh, one was, uh, uh, and the, the, the first one was from an incredibly intelligent, sophisticated editor at the Atlantic Monthly Press uh, who had, had been, I'd been sending him 100 pages at a time. Big mistake. Wait till you're done. So I, so I, I was in, he said, come on, come on, come on. All right. And, and he wrote me an elegant essay when I sent in the fourth sheaf of 100 pages. He said, dear boy, what have you done? <laughs> and then he basically wrote an essay on, on a pastoral novel. And, this, and I thought, OK. So I did all that. And then he wrote this beautiful essay. And that seals it up. Nothing more to be done or said. And so I put the thing aside. It's somewhere. <laughs> but then when I took on a, a longer crazy one. I had a wonderful ex-Marine captain for an editor. And, uh, and he, he was, I don't know whether he did this on purpose or whether, uh, whatever it was, but he, he was awkward. He said, I don't know, chapter three, something, I don't know. Maybe it's chapter four, I don't know, but it's somewhere in there. You know? And I thought, okay. And, and actually, it was a little more explicit than that. And of course, the main thing he said is, it's way too long. Because it was, um, geez, I'm trying to remember. I think it was 600 typed pages. And uh, so I, I, and I threw out 100 pages. There they were on the floor. And, um, and uh, uh, I've written little things in the margin. And I, this, is, this shows you how long ago this was. This was. So I took this, this stuff with the marginal comments to a, 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 a typist who, who had typed it, and she typed it up. And it came out to 623 pages. <laughs> and I sent it, and both my agent and my editor said, it's much shorter. <laughs> and I owe that lesson to I, I, it, it sounds as though it's to you, but, but it's, it's, I'm, 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 I'm winding up now on this one. To a, a fencing teacher that I had when I was uh, 18, uh, named Edo Marian, and he, had, he was an Italian. And, uh, uh, and, uh, the, the, and the first thing, he, he moved me from foil to, to saber. Uh, and he says, and, and, the, and the first thing he said was, he said, in foil you must be lightning quick. For Saber, twice as quick as that. And then we did that for a while. He said, ah, John, John, that how, how the frog catch the fly? I said, because he's quick as lightning. He said, no, because he has tempo. <laughs> and I said, yeah, that's right. So that, way, that's a, that story and the Greyhound bus story. Are the <laughs> now it's an airplane. Not an airplane, yes, okay. okay. What about, is there, for, for writers, people who, who want to become a writer, is there, any, is there an aptitude test or a certain uh, background or way of approaching it that well, you think bears fruit? They, I think to Jonathan Swift, I'm sure there's a scholar in the audience who will set me right, who said there are two kinds of writers. There are bees who go out and gather nectar and bring it back in and make the honeycombs. And there's spiders who pull it out. Well, how does a spider pull it out? They pull it out. It's, but it comes from that labyrinth inside themselves. For bees, there, I, yeah, the, for bees, there is a, 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 a one. It's not the complete aptitude test, but it's it, it, um, uh, John Cheever. Uh, what once said that he owed a lot of his his work to the fact that he could uh, eat at a very crowded, noisy restaurant and hear what was said at the table four tables away and remember it four years later. So the answer is you've got to be nosy and have a good memory, and I, I think that, I think that's that's. That's probably the aptitude. Aside from that, it's, it, 
it's you have to you yeah you know, I, I say they, they yeah you've got to be you've, you've you've got to be in love with your own language but not not puppy love well you'll go through puppy love and then and then and then you'll and then you'll get you know smacked in the face the way you know we all did and then and then you get better at it uh, uh, because there's so many different ways I'm always astounded there's so many different ways, but the, but the, the, there are there are, and there there's some exercises, but those are the, that's that's like thinking that that the that 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 that, 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 that what you see in a ballet room with the people stretching at the bar that that's really dance. I mean, it, it, there there are things you can do that are helpful, but basically you just got to get going, uh, uh, and uh, and then and then put it aside and. And, and, and then carefully seek advice. Probably not your parents. <laughs> uh, or your husband or wife or girlfriend or boyfriend. But, and I have had for a long time three people lined up. And one was a, a guy very smart. And he would say, you know, oh, John, 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 I love it. Give me more, give me more. Well, there was, a part, I don't know, we're a little slow. But no, I just love it. I love it. Give me more. So, and, Basically, a lot of encouragement and yeah, and then t t t Tony Winner is uh, who taught here for years, uh, uh, and he, he's and he uh, well a, an example for Compass Rose. Yeah, that's what it was very, very wrong, and and he wrote me. Um, he types with one finger, and he wrote an eight-page single-spaced letter commenting on each chapter. And there was one sentence I, 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 re, I re remember. He said, the end is simultaneously too hasty and too elegiac, which I thought was, and, and I thought, yeah, that's right. You know, so, and then the last step is my Scots editor. As a Welsh friend of mine said, the Scots are never so happy as when they're setting other people right. And uh, I remember when I was on my way to do battle with her, and uh, Deborah Eisenberg, I, whom I adore, and, uh, uh, and, and I'm sure I'll be qu quoting her uh, even more than this, I said, at last I can stand up to my Scots editor, because after all, I'm a Celt too, and you know what happens when Celt meets Celt, and Deborah Eisenberg said, the Jew hides under the bed, <laughs> which I, I was enchanted by that. But... Uh, Okay, yeah, all right, that's the, the aptitude <clears throat> test. But we were talking the other night about um, how the publishing world is changing and um, the loss of those editors in some ways. We've, we've gone from a time when a author worked for a particular house for their career to, um, and, and when there was, I don't know if a pyramid structure is, is the right model, but... Um, where there was a structure to work up through to where it's become very flat now with the advent of publishing on demand and Kindles and electronic distribution and, and you had some thoughts on the the loss that's there when, when the editors start well I, I, it's, I've, I've only had I've had one editor since I was 34 that's a long time ago yeah. and uh, and, and I really love her, but she's sometimes wrong, and then and it's hard, and I, it just drives me nuts. And sometimes, we, as I was saying, the, an agent, and I'm very fond of my a, 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 agent, but his job, although with, I've had such a long-standing relationship with with uh, with my editor that that he doesn't have to find the editor. A good agent, if you're looking for for one, and you should put it off as long as possible, um, knows not only the publishing houses, but the editor in the house who will be receptive to this story, this book. And that's harder, because let's say they're, they're, they're probably 37, well, they're more, but they're, they're 37 houses that the agent will know that, that way. And, and he, he'll be able to say, OK, I'm going to send it to this guy, because he was I, now you know he loves to go trout fishing or something like that. Um, 
at. So it's, 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 it's a hard job, but it's not as hard as the editor. The editor is trying to sell, a, let's say it's a middle list book, trying to, find, trying to sell it to 25,000 people or something. And, and um, so she is often conflicted because she's giving you advice which she hopes, hopes will make the book sell better, some of it coming from the sales department, I may say. Uh, uh, but but uh, my, my editor is, is fairly tough about that, with an exception that I'll point out in a minute. And, and, and she also, and m most editors got into the business because they love writing. And they're not making a whole lot of dough either. You know? and, uh, so, th th and it's, it, that I, I, I can't imagine, I, I mean, I, I remember seeing a, um, I'm very bad at, at what, what some students of mine, <laughs> and I've never, a, 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 in, in the, a, a very good undergrad class, I think it was last fall, uh, someone convinced me that, that, I said, I'm not very good at this computing stuff, the inter, and he said, interweb, and I've been calling it the interweb, and, and then they all laughed. And I thought it was great. Apparently, inter show of hands, who thinks interweb is a real word? Okay, oh, you were in the class. <laughs> no, no, you know, no, you're not, no. Okay, all right. I'm just, in any case, they, they, people were rejoicing. They said, no longer will we have the tyranny of these elite editors who are keeping my work out of print out of that, they're keeping, the, you know, the public is waiting for me, and here it is, and there was this barrier, and now it has been torn down. You know, hooray, you know, and they sang the Marseillaise or something. Well, I, and I, I, I was both annoyed with them because, it, but, and also felt really sad because they're going to, they're, they're, you, you need not just an editor, but you need probably a couple of readers. Uh, because otherwise you'll, you'll, you'll you know, there, there's stuff that'll just go floating by. I just say, oh my God, that got into print. You know, and, it, and it's there for a long time. Uh, so, um, uh, yeah, I think the, uh, so, that, so, they're, so they're missing that. And, then, and, and also, and there's a, I don't think people read as carefully when they read from the screen. Uh, they read a lot faster. I read faster. I go, yeah, okay, got that, you know. Sort of, uh, it's kind of Evelyn Wood. You know. who, who remembers Evelyn Wood? Okay, Evelyn Wood taught speed reading. And as I said, this is how you read. And that would, be, that would be good if you were a lawyer looking at an insurance contract in which, which they're, they're all the same, more or less, and, and you're just looking for the thing that sticks out. So, uh, 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 they tried to put a fast one over, over on us there. So anyway, it's, it, uh, yeah. I, I can't write on a computer either. I write letters. I mean, what, e email. Yeah, email. I write e e email. And, uh, uh, but but I, I couldn't compose on it. Who was it that, that even when electric typewriters came, came along, I remember talking to some sort of senior writers. I, I don't think it was Kurt Vonnegut, but someone about that same, same age. He said, I can't stand the hum thing. When are you going to say something, bud? You know, so, I, 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 and I'm, a, a lot of the writers I, I know and admire write longhand and then, and then, and then transcribe it. Uh, but um, it, obviously, they're, they're people who write very well on computers. I mean, I, I, can't, I can't tell the difference uh, from now. At, at first, I could. When the computers first came along, you could tell. Uh, who was writing on a, on a computer? Just the thrill. It's easier to type, right? It would get way too long. But yeah, so I don't know. It's got. It, 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 uh, my third daughter, here's why I like books. My third daughter came, came was on, she's getting her. PhD. She went. Actually, she's amazing. She got kicked out of Charlottesville High School, which is hard to do. I really and then and came home and said, and I, "I said, what are you going to do?" She said, uh, "Homeschooling." I said, "I could do do French and history." And she said, "I don't mean by you, just sign." <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So she went, and then after, so she went to Piedmont, where she had two great teachers, great, as good as anywhere. And then she, and I said, well, so you want to go to college? She said, sure. And I said, well, you don't have a high school degree, and you didn't bother to get the associate's degree. She said, I'm going to St. John's Great Books. All you have to do is write four, four essays. And she was right, right here. But she, and she read all those books, and she came back. And she was uh, saying, well, I still want a room in your house. And make, this is years later. I mean, she's been, uh, and, and, and she said, I'll need more bookshelf space. And we put in more bookshelves, bookshelves. And I said, yeah, so you, you would like having, and she said, yes. It's a, it's a history of what I've learned and, and a history of my mind, and I want it there. And I, even if I never pick up that book again and read it, I know it's next to this book and this book. So having a library is just crucial, it seems to me. Now, if you're going on a, if you're going on the, you know, a long, you know, some three months trip, and you want a lot of light reading, you're not going to carry thirty books, you know. But so, yeah, then you can do it. Well, so your so your own recent book, Beyond the First Draft, is not a certainly not a how-to manual. It's not about the the fundamentals of writing. It's for people that are further along. I think that are. Uh, Getting to where they've 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 done the kind of put in the initial hours and they're looking for that next step and what I kept finding was that some of the essays like they, they strike me as ones that will hit that can hit you at just the right time when you're struggling with your own revision. Um, I, I actually don't struggle with revising talking about sex too much, but do you want to talk about that? Right, you had some practical advice on, oh, on writing about oh, sex that was yes. uh, that was oh, useful. Well. By, by accident, I, there's a, a woman named Elizabeth Benedict who wrote a book called The Joy of Writing Sex. She put the, remember The Joy of Sex? Is there, okay, all right, so The Joy of Writing Sex. And I discovered somewhat to my chagrin that uh, there were lengthy quotations from my first novel, uh, which apparently was, I can't remember it, but... Uh, uh, and for, then maybe even for, for what it's worth, I remember being in workshop and having a peer say, "You know who does good sex scenes?" <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, it was Stan Stan Williams. Oh, I, I, I and uh, uh, but but there is but I've sort of come to less is more. But it, it, the, the, the essay goes goes back and forth, and you, and you, and and, uh, and uh, um, uh, Liz <laughs> Benedict, Benedict who put the thing together interviewed a lot of people who, 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 whom I know, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and their answer, the, the answer that, that, that disappointed me was John Updike, who said, I don't like other writers' sex scenes nearly as much as my own, and I always get aroused by my own. And I thought, get over yourself, pal. But, but it was, and, but, but the, the, one, the one that I liked and, you know, you know the, the thing that I, I often try and get and get um, uh, uh, two explanations of something, one sort of in high rhetoric and the other in low. And I, I'm going to give you the high rhetoric uh, somewhere in here. Deborah Eisenberg, I keep quoting her. And she, she was lovely about this. Oh, yeah. <laughs> The reason she doesn't have explicit sex scenes or, 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 or is very careful. The anatomical possibilities are limited. So a poorly written sex scene can be a little like hearing an eight-year-old describe the plot of his favorite movie. And on the other hand, because every reader brings to every sex scene vivid prior experience, writing graphically about sex can also be a little like writing dead mother. You'll get a response, all right, but it might not be the response you want, or the response that proceeds from all the careful work you've done to show exactly what's happening between these two particular people, or these 12 particular people, right now. <laughs> and it goes on like, like, like that. Anyway, it's very, it's very good. Uh, uh, yeah. Um, the problems of cliché and generality, which are exactly what writing is a battle against, are especially hard to outwit when you're writing about sex because the reader's response is likely to be automatic and blinding. It's as if a flash were going off, obscuring all the specifics and detail and nuance you've constructed so carefully about your characters and their encounter. 
Of course, that's the way sex sometimes works in real life, you know. Well, I actually don't happen to care just now who that person is. If that's what you want, fine. I, <laughs> I find this just charming and true. And uh, so there's the rather ele elegant way. And here's a story that somebody told me. I don't know, it was a guy next to me on the Greyhound. This mythical greyhound uh, 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 said, so, uh, and I don't know if it's true or not, or if it's just a, a, a kind of traveling salesman joke, but uh, so there's a guy who, who was a salesman, and he won the salesman award for the Cincinnati air area, and the prize was a trip to Paris. And uh, so off he goes to, to Paris, and his friends wish, have a great time, Jack. And Jack goes off to Paris, and he comes back, and they all take him out to a restaurant. They said, Jack, so what was it like, uh, Perry, gay Perry? He said, well, uh, I said, I, the, the Louvre was great, and I, and I, went, to the, I went to the opera. He said, no, no, come on, come, you know, okay. Well, yeah, well, one time I did meet this very attractive French woman who spoke some English, and, and uh, we had, we had coffee, and then she wanted to um, uh, uh, show me something. I, I complimented her dress, and she wanted to show me something I didn't quite understand. We went back to her apart apartment, and and uh, and uh, and somehow one thing did lead to another, and she showed me uh, where, how French women uh, wear perfume. There's a little dab behind the ear, and a little dab here, and then there's they sometimes put it high on the upper thigh. Yeah, the guy said, and then what? He said, well, the rest is just the same as in Cincinnati. <laughs> <laughs> so put in the perfume, but you can leave out. Yeah, uh, that, that's, uh, but, so less is more, but on the other hand, in the, in the essay on sex here, that I have, I, I talk about how the, the, the sort of short, the, the short versions, and then I realize that D.H. Lawrence has a, lo a beautiful story called The Horse Dealer's Daughter, which is massive in its sort of language. I mean, and it's not, but it's the psychology of it, of, of desire, rather than the, uh, rather than the, the uh, sort of Illustrated judo hold. Uh, so it, it's, I don't know. It's, we, it's, we can do that if you want. No, no. I didn't know you cared. Yeah, no. But, uh, yeah so that, yeah, so it's, it's, it's I, and I think I, I, I don't know, I guess there was, I guess there were some uh, more vivid sex scenes early, earlier in the stuff that I did. Oh, I know there was one where I wanted to show that that this young lawyer was sleeping with the ex-mistress of a senior partner. And uh, well, a story that I actually kind of like. I'm to, and, and the guy simply, rem it's a first person story, and he simply re remarks, I'd never known anyone uh, who changed the sheets daily. And you think, ah, you see, and that's all you need to know. Well, it, you had some other practical advice one time about talking about um, you, writers are told sometimes write about what you know, and so you start bring, introducing uh, Aunt Flora or your mother, um, some often against their wishes. So how do you how do you disguise them? How do you if you if if you are importing people near and dear to you, how do you still make it to Thanksgiving? Uh, <laughs> well, no, through Thanksgiving. Through Thanksgiving, yeah, that's right. Uncle Charlie was the oldest of my mother's uh, four b brothers. Yeah, four brothers. And they're all dead now, but he, he was, and he was, uh, he got better and better with age. He died at the age of 95. And from uh, 85 to 95, he was a sweetheart. Before then, not so good. But one of the things, every time a story of mine would come out and everything, he was sure it was about him. And there was no way to dissuade him. And it just wasn't. I was innocent, I think. But another time, a, a very smart friend of mine, 
he, the, the one who says, uh, you know, John, 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 I love it, I love it, can, can give me more. This is a guy who's a very smart law professor. Uh, and, and, he, he, and he wrote himself when he was at Yale Law School where he was first in his class and babysitting his two small children while his wife worked. And, and he also wrote uh, three stories and sold one to the New Yorker. His classmates hated him. <laughs> you can see why, but especially those fathers who said, I, I, I can't, darling, I've got to prepare for contracts. You know, but, uh, I mean, but, so he's, he's very smart, and he read An American Romance, which was the first novel that I wrote. I'd actually written a lot of stories. And he said, he said, I love it, I love it, I love it. He said, not only that, I, I love Anya, the heroine. I mean, she's tough. And, I mean, and, 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 and smart. And I love her, her sort of theories. It was him. <laughs> you change the sex, they don't know. <laughs> so that's one, that's one way. Uh, is, is, and... Uh, uh, you know, actually, I, I, I could have not, and he, because it, it was perfectly, it wasn't. I mean, it's very hard to write characters who are really just total, you know, 14 Boy Scout merit badges, and they're wonderful, you know, because it, you know, and, and, but, but, so I had to give, I mean, but, but, uh, 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 and, and of course, the other truth that's very hard to explain to people is you, you can use three characteristics that are visible, and clearly, you know, and, and people say, uh, um, uh, but, but, and it, it turns out it's someone you like very much, but, you, but as the story goes on, you and I said, they're, they're going to do something really horrible. And, and I was once embarrassed with this. There was a, there's a character, a recurring character, who is called Miss Perry, both in Spartina and in Compass Rose, and uh, uh, Tony Winner wrote, you have, you, you should be careful not to pedestalize uh, Miss Perry. Well, she was based very much on, on a woman named Jean Richmond, who was an eccentric single woman who lived in a great stone house, and who I really loved. And, but every year she had, a, 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 I heard from friends of hers that she got very depressed and she would take to her bed and not get up, and it was the anniversary of her father's death. I mean, it was, uh, so it was, and she was a, 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 a maiden lady of some years. And uh, so I was, years had passed since I had lived in Rhode Island, and, uh, and, I, and, and, I, and, and I had heard that she had died, so I felt free to go. I was at a book signing in a little town in Rhode Island, and, uh, and she had this Eleanor Roosevelt voice. I mean, because she said, John, how very pleasant to see you. And I said, well, yeah. And she said, friends of mine have told me that I very much resemble your Miss Perry. And I was thinking, and he said, oh, but just, but just, the, just the good part. <laughs> just, and he said, well, uh, you have somewhat exaggerated my state of mind. I, it's true, I take to my bed with a pile of mystery novels, and I'm quite happy. And I said, oh, oh, oh OK. But it was, anyway, uh, it was, I, so you can get it. It was, it, that, that was the thing, the taking to bed with a pile of mystery novels, uh, you know, but that, that, uh, yeah, I blew that one. <laughs> but 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 it turns out I wish she'd lived long enough because she did that. I wish she'd lived long enough to see the part she plays in Compass Rose. So there we are. Yes, I. Um, well, yes. Just, I, I was yeah. just going to say I have I have more questions, but I thought maybe we should see if anyone in the audience wants to ask one as well. I think there's a microphone in the back. Oh. Volunteers. Volunteers. Yeah, I always like to uh, kick things off. Um, could you compare uh, writing students at the start of your writing career to today's writing students? And uh, do they seem to want to stay within molds or break molds? That's two questions. <laughs> All right. Related. Compare, yeah, too late. Comparing them. 
I've been doing this for, you know, off and on, pretty much on, since 1972 here, and I did a little bit. And the good ones are good. <clears throat> They've read a lot. Uh, this whole thing about people don't read anymore. These guys read a lot. It, it, it both <coughs> both uh, sort of standard stuff, but also bizarre little nooks and crannies. That, <laughs> so students, the, the people who are, who are possessed to write, same. Now, are they, in, are they more interested in, in breaking modes? I have a little experimental writing for the sake of being an experimental writer. Is, it's not doomed, but it's likely to not work out. And there's an interesting example that one of the wonderful stories, the name of which will come to me, Lost in the Funhouse by John Barth. Experimental. It's genius because the experiment and the, and the kind of meta commentary exactly harmonize with each other. This, this kid is in a terrible state of mind and this terrible state of mind is completely. Other John Barth stories, not all that, he wrote a lot of other good, good ones. And then there's somewhere he's just, you know, he's just being clever. And, yeah. and so uh, John Barth, that was a long time ago. And occasionally you get people, no, n no one that I recognize in this room uh, was, I said, I'm going to be experimental. And, and if after a year, or, you know, said, you know, maybe that wasn't such a good idea. And, 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 and so it, it's, uh, um, yeah, I, in f over 40 years, what, 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 72 is when I got here, but then I've come and gone, sort of. But it's, um, um, the students are better now uh, because we were sort of floundering at, at, uh, for, for a while. But the good ones back then and the good ones now, I mean, uh, one of my early students, uh, uh, Brees Pancake, is, 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 he, <laughs> I mean, he was, he, he was painful uh, uh, and uh, I became very fond of him and he asked me to be his godfather when he converted to Catholicism. He came from a small town in West Virginia. And he, he, he was either going to be a communist or a Catholic, just, just to get out of there. But he, uh, very, uh, 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 yeah, his, his, so he was early on. I got, he, he, he died in, wait, I've got to get the right year, 79. Or seven, yeah, 79, 1979. So that's a, that's a while back. And, and recently, Folio Magazine, which is a very fancy thing, and a pretty good English writer named James Lasland was asked by Folio to pick the best short story of the 20th century, and he picked Reese's story, Hollow. So, you know, that, that's, I mean, I, and it, it, it's, I'm, I'm not sure that, I'm, I mean, that's amazing. And, he, and his book has been in print ever since, let's see, I, 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 after he died, I, I found a letter. And uh, basically saying, take care of my stories. I sold, a, he had sold already three, I sold three more, and then, then got the book to come out. And uh, it's been interesting. I've got, uh, uh, and I, then I sold the Italian rights, and the French rights, and the German rights, I didn't do that. Japanese rights, they sent me a copy I, I was trying to read it. I, I was going. I, I should have started at the back. Uh, and, and, but uh, yeah, so you get amazing people. But there, there, there's some other. But there are writers now. I mean, who are going to be just as as significant? And and uh, and uh, I mean, although he was he was truly possessed. Uh, and uh, and uh, yeah, you can. There's a, there's an archive of his stuff in the special collections. I, th I feel like a, a, a stewardess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like, I've always what wanted was the to do that. Question? Yeah. What was the second question? Oh, okay. oh, I did both. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. The, Thank you, uh, Van <clears throat> Vanessa. You know that, that Vanessa was a name that was made up by Jonathan Swift? Yes. And I have a niece named with that name. Also. So, uh, I don't know. There's a bit of a... 
in, in, this, in this era of instant cellular communications, I do wonder about that. I, I've seen writers today struggle with that. You know, you watch a UVA student on the bus every five seconds, they're texting, but texting usually makes for a pretty boring, pretty boring novel, so I think they generally sidestep that technology when they write. But it's an added challenge because it's such, such a part of the lives today, I think. There's a, there, there. Thanks, John. Uh, you're known, at least locally, you're pretty famous for uh, taking a long time on your <laughs> fiction. And uh, so I guess the question would be, as a teacher of fiction, uh, what do you say to your students in terms of when do you know it's done? You take a toothpick and you stick it in, and if it comes out <laughs> clean, the cake is done. No, I, geez. Um, you know, uh, uh, so you can stick the toothpick in, or you, or you can follow the Melville. You know, every every draft is a draft of a draft of a draft, and you're never done. But uh, but which is that's going over the oh, that way too far. But um, I, I think Mel Some, yeah. Mel Melville ended up working in a post office, or where he, he correct? No, he, Hawthorne was the customs house. Melville had a I, lot of. I don't think. I think Melville. Jobs. He, he had Relative a hard, obscurity. When yeah, yeah, no, he, 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 yeah, he, he had a harder time. And it always amazes me. Hawthorne, uh, uh, Melville treated Hawthorne like his, his, his better older brother. And I mean, I like Hawthorne, but, I, but Melville is, the, I think, the real thing. But I, I, done, done. Um, um, It's so hard. It's so you know that's that's where you almost need someone else to to, to say. Uh, well, well, there's things. One is sometimes you think, okay, I've done all I can do. It's just run out. I have no more energy to give this, and 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 sometimes that's true, and sometimes you you know go for a hike and come back. I feel like I can do a little more, but. Um, uh, it's, so you can go dead on your own stuff, and then the question is, if you, uh, how long do you wait? Or you get very good advice. They say, this is, this is, this is it. And, 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 every, and, and then you, uh, with the editor who was giving me a hard time about Compass Rose, she kept saying, I mean, contradictory things. And she would move me sideways that way, and, I'd see it, and then I would, I would think of doing that, and then go back there and finally I said no no this is that's it it's done and I, I had been, I had followed half of her advice say she, she told me 10 things I did five of them and and five of them were just moving sideways so it's really hard what, what do you do how, how do you Bob has written a number of a number of books the first thing I read was a novel and then there was another novel and then seven history books yeah yeah yeah, yeah. And, uh, and, uh, how do you know when you're done it just comes out. It, there's, no, <laughs> there's no second draft. There's nothing. It's just there's a beginning. There's an end. It's really? A, it's a stream. That's going to make people... Uh, Nick, uh, Nick if, Taylor. If, if you think my l lawyer friend who was first in his class at Yale Law School is going to be hated by... <laughs> well, <laughs> people in you know Nick, Nick Taylor. Probably you do. What? Nick Taylor. He was one of your students. Oh, yeah? MFA well, student. he, 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 and he's what my son-in-law. Yes, I know, I know. Yeah, I, but, I know. But anyway, I mean, nobody writes faster than him. Oh. But well, then he writes 10 or 15 drafts. Well, there is the famous case, which I envy, because I, 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 like I like to read some quite, quite these stories. Georges Simenon, who writes the Maigret series, but also some medium serious no no novels. And he started writing before World War I, and and I think, and he kept writing until he was, until he died, and he wrote, he would write, a novel in a weekend. And he would take a ream of paper, 144, whoosh, over there, and tell his wife to keep everyone away, line up all his tobacco pipes. If anyone read any any of the Maigret stories? Okay, well you'll always he's always filling his pipe. So, it's just, it's a, so that, and, and, and then he would put the paper in, you know, 
and put it face down in here. If anyone came into his study, he threw it away. He said, you've interrupted the flow. And I thought, God, would that be wonderful? And, 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 but then I thought, because I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm sometimes, some things are, are really slow. And sometimes it's slow because I've put it aside for a while. Um, Evelyn Waugh would go to a hotel and, and face a blank wall and get it done in three weeks. Now, in both cases, Simonon and Evelyn Waugh, they'd been thinking and thinking. And, and so, uh, so who, who knows? I mean, and, and, and uh, Simonon, I think, only did, he would do three or four books a year. But, it, I mean, his, because he lived a long time, I mean, it's the list is single space, just like that. And some of them are really good. Uh, I don't know. It's a, a no. You must the 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 the, the Eddie Rickenbacker based n novel that must have taken you a while. Well, he'd been thinking about it a while, too. Yeah. OK, well, well, uh, yes. Well, I don't know what I, I can, uh, any advice I have for anyone else, but I, you know, you know when it's done. Any? Why is that a cultural question for us? Is it economically bound? We've got to create a genius. What is it that we say, can you teach writing? Because no one comes out of the womb knowing how to produce text. Why do we ask that question? It causes all sorts of problems, I think, culturally. Sorry. Gosh, no, well, you can, yes, you can certainly, you can certainly get someone to write better if they're writing, even if they're writing a, 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 a law brief, uh, uh, actually, which requires some pretty, I mean, it, it's, it, it's good to be clear. Uh, and you can even, uh, uh, and, and for, for practical purposes, but that, This is actually, this is interesting. This is almost exactly the opposite of the question that you well, it, it, reminded me of last night. Yeah, sometimes it may, maybe what you're asking is like the talent question. It yeah. goes to that in some ways. And I, because I've often, I've often told my undergraduates, it's like at, at some level, when you start, you do have to believe you're Neo from the Matrix. Like, I'm the one. Yeah. Right? I mean, you have to believe that. But then what happens is you go to some place like AWP, the, the Association of Writers and Writing Program Conference now, if you, the next one's in Minneapolis. If you go there, there's going to be 10,000 writers just like you at that conference, 10,000 neos. <laughs> so who's the one? It's the, and, you know, and then it becomes persistence. But I, I don't know. I, the writing, teaching writing, I think you can shave some of the time yeah. to a degree. Like if... If it was it Mac, Malcolm Gladwell says it takes ten thousand hours of any activity to master it, you know maybe so maybe you can tamp it down to eight thousand through good writing instruction. I, I think you can help yeah. with that. Well, yeah, and there, there, there yeah, if you, if if you're talking about writing clearly, that can be taught. Writing, writing in, in, in so that you, but but the much more mysterious thing is. Is is the thing that can't be taught, and it is, and it and it and it is talent, and and you can you can you can I'm gonna say you can stimulate that talent yourself or get someone else to help, but 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 I, I, I mean what, what, one of the words that, that's that's become a pejorative in our society is elite elitist. I'm an elitist. I don't want to read B plus stuff. I don't want to read A minus stuff. I, I, w I want to read in divinely inspired stuff, and then I'll read, and then I'll read um, Simonon at, at, at night, but which is also pretty damn inspired from 
from time to time. But there's, there's no, I, 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 the, the idea that everyone has a, has, has a, uh, 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 has a book inside her or him. Uh, well, they probably do, but they're not necessarily the ones to write it. Uh, I mean, it's, it, what? Not what you're saying, yeah. When you say we can teach writing, we're not saying that everyone has a book inside of her. But you certainly can teach. Um, and e editors teach you, and you go back and forth, and there's dialogue. And That's craft. Okay. Uh, art's harder. Um, uh, and, and there are parts of art that are truly, that are truly, uh, uh, you don't know where they come from. I was just, I got a long letter, email, an e letter. Uh, from a woman who I met, met at, at Swanee some years ago, and and she said, "I'm writing you because because uh, uh, I, I have faith in you because you knew the ancient name for my for my uh, native country room, Mania, which is Dacia, which I happen to know because I did a lot of Latin. But uh, and so she, lucky you. Got, it turns out she's written a lot of books." And in her, she's got blogs and Twitter tweet things going on. And, uh, and, and she has a lot of essays out there. And the sentence that struck me, she said she was doing an in interview. And mostly it's the interview for you know, radio and stuff like that is generally, you, 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 even at NPR, you want to repeat the name of your book over and over. <laughs> it's, 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 ad, it's, it's an ad that you're tr trying to do. So, uh, but, but in one of the things, someone said, so, uh, so uh, but, but tell us more uh, 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 about you as a, an inspired writer. And he said, well, the person you're talking to right now isn't the person who writes my book. It's someone else. Really? <laughs> they, they missed it the first beat around. I mean, and she means that, that she gets into a zone that is half auto-hypnosis, but not complete. My third daughter, who knows everything about Freud, I was, I was trying some of this stuff out on her. I was saying, well, you know, there's, there's, there's a, a wonderful essay by Yevgeny Zamyatin, who wrote a novel called We, which was the first uh, dystopian novel of the 20th century. Orwell reviewed it, and people have accused him of cribbing from it. I, I've read both books, and it, he, he just said, if Zamyatin can do that, I can do this for 1984. But uh, 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 Zamyatin uh, is talking about how he uh, has, when he's fully conscious, he can't write. When he's fully unconscious, he can't write because he's asleep. And there's that and he compares it to the light switch on a, in a railroad compartment. This is Russian. He said, when it's full on, it's light, you know, you can do anything, you can order a meal or whatever it is. And then when it's off, it's off and you're asleep. He said, but there's an intermediate when there's just a faint blue glow. And he said, that's when, that's when I finally discovered that. That's when I got, and then he talks about, and then there's, there's a wonderful, image that he uses, which I, I hope I'm going to get this right, he said, when, you, when your mind is, is suffused with all of these details that you've noticed and they're floating around and you're in the blue zone and, and there's one other detail that comes in and he said, it is, that is like, uh, I think I may have changed it, that is like putting a glass rod into a super saturated solution. All of the salt crystals condense around it and make one thing. And he said, he said that's, that, that's what I'm living for. <laughs> he then, <laughs> well, anyway, there's another part to that. But it's, it's, it's just that mysterious, Russians will talk about it, some French people will talk about it, Hemingway won't talk about it, and most Americans say, you know, you talk about it, you, you lose it. It's, this, it's the same people who tell you, you don't want to make love the night before the first the, the big game. Or the boxing match, or whatever it is. It's, we don't know if this is true or not. We, maybe you can talk about it. The Irish talk about it a lot too, about things and write 
nonfiction. But uh, yes, we started and then we went around in a loop. Do uh, we have any? We, uh, no one else is coming right away, but I, we may have, I may have tried these people's patience unless someone else is something urgent uh, to, to come up. But uh, do you want to announce about that? Yeah, the, the, yeah the books are, books yeah, are, well, for, are for sale. Thank some, you. Yeah, some of the stuff uh, is, 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 I have repeated, but most of what I said today was just brand new. <laughs> just for you. Uh,